In these days of Internet of Things, it is advisable to have a redundant network than a flat network, especially for production networks, which are expected to be up for most of the time, as in 99.999%. Welcome to another informational lesson of Technology for All Academy, an academy that teaches information communication technology networking for free. To mention but a few, we have Cisco and Microtech series, and we'll be doing other vendor series in the future. For those who don't know me, my name is Taba Makobe, the founder of Technology for All Academy. In today's lesson, our focus will be on learning 802.1D or what most people will also refer to as classic span and tree protocol. I will first start by discussing why we prefer redundant networks over flat networks. And to do that, I'll open my GNS3 as I've made some notes on GNS3. As you can see on flat networks, I have two scenarios. The first one is two switches and the second one I have three switches on it. So what is the problem with flat networks? The problem with flat networks is that if we have a failure, our network will be broken into two. Like for example, if the link between switch 4 and switch 1 somehow breaks or it goes down, then there won't be communication between the two. And if we have important resources like servers and printers on our network, meaning we won't be able to reach those. And that will be a disaster if this was a production network. Because in production networks, downtime is equal to money, meaning we'll be losing money when the network is down. The same also applies on scenario 2. If anything breaks, we'll be losing money because as we said, the downtime is equal to money. So what if we decide to make our network a redundant network and then we connect switch 5 to switch 11 and then we have a redundant network like this. It will be perfect provided that spanning tree protocol is in place. Without spanning tree protocol in place, there will be chaos in the network. As we all know, switches operate on layer 2, and layer 2 does not have time to leave field. Time to leave field is on layer 3 or network layer. So if a broadcast message is transmitted from one of the switches, it will cause loops in the network. As we all know, broadcast message is sent to all ports except the transmitting port. So all three switches will flood the message and this can cause broadcast storm and corrupt the MAC address table. And the only solutions or diagnosis to this will be to implement or configure spanning tree protocol or to disconnect one of the link. Fortunately, spanning tree protocol is enabled by default on most switches from different vendors. Take note. Spanning tree protocol function is to stop loops on redundant links. And we all know redundancy is good for modern networks as it provides faster conversions. Meaning when active link is down, the backup link will take over immediately. Unlike flat network where a network engineer will have to go and troubleshoot the fault first before he can diagnose while the network is still down. Spanning tree protocol allows the network engineer to troubleshoot the fault while the network is still running as the backup link will take over and when he is done with the diagnosis of the fault the main link will take over and the backup will go down again up until it is needed now before we can discuss the operation of spanning tree protocol i'll first start by introducing the spanning tree ports mode and the first mode that we have is root port root port is in a forwarding state is forwarding towards the root bridge and we have one per switch the second port that we'll talk about is designated port. It's also in a forwarding state and it's forwarding away from the switch. And we have one per link or per segment. All the ports of the root bridge are designated ports. And last but not least, we have the alternate or blocking port. It's a non-forwarding port. A backup link is a link that takes over when the main link or active link goes down. So now the big question is how does spanning tree really operate? All switches send what we call bridge protocol data units or BPDUs every 2 seconds by default. And if we have redundant links, all switches will contend for the root bridge. And the switch with the lowest bridge ID will be elected as the root bridge. I have made some notes 
let's go down so you might be asking yourself what is a bridge id bridge id is combination of priority and mac address by default the priority is 32,768 in decimal or it's 8,000 in hexadecimal and it uses the increment of 4,096 in decimal or 1,000 in hexadecimal and as we said bridge ID is used to elect the root bridge so what is the root bridge? the root bridge we can say is the controlling switch for span entry protocol when the root bridge is selected the remaining switches or non root bridge will find the best path to reach the root bridge and to do that, they will use the path cost to elect the root port. And as we have said before, we only have one root port per switch. So what will happen is that the root bridge will advertise the cost of zero to the other switches. And let's say in case of scenario one, switch two will see that the root bridge is advertising the cost of zero. And for it to get to the root bridge using the directly connected link, between switch 2 and switch 1 is the cost of 4 and it will also look on the other link which goes via switch 3 and for that it will see that it's a cost of 8 because from switch 2 to switch 3 is a cost of 4 and also switch 3 is also advertising its cost of 4 to get to the root bridge so it's a cost of 8 meaning switch 2 will elect the directly connected link or port as our root port okay let me label it before we go any further i know you might be asking yourself what is path cost and where did we get this force and eight that we are talking about well path cost is nothing but a value given to a link bandwidth in spanning tree protocol for example 10 megabits per second is equal to the cost of 100 100 megabits per second is equal to the cost of 90 and 1 gigabit per second is equal to the cost of 4 while 10 gigabit per second is equal to the cost of 2 meaning in our scenarios we use 1 gigabit per second bandwidth because our non-root bridges are advertising the cost of 4 to get to the root bridge before we can carry on let me write the path cost quickly into our notes so that you have them for reference now that i'm finished with modifying my notes let's carry on with our scenario now we're gonna go to switch 3. Switch 3 will also like to elect the root bridge and it will also compare their path cost. And then if we check the directly connected cost from switch 3 to switch 1, we can see it's the cost of 4. And then when it goes to the link via switch 2, from switch 3 to switch 2, there's, a, there's an advertisement of 4 and from switch 2 to switch 1 is an advertisement of 4 which makes this link to be the cost of 8 so switch 3 will also choose the directly connected link as the root port okay let's label it and as we have said the designated ports are forwarding away from the root bridge and we also said that the root bridge all its ports are designated ports so and as you can see they are forwarding away they are going to switch 2 and switch 3 okay let's label our ports designated port now what about the link between switch 2 and switch 3 on this link one switch will elect these ports as designated port and the other will take the blocking port or alternate port and to do that they'll start with their path cost to elect which one is the designated port and we have already seen that both switches have the cost of 8 to reach the root bridge the second step or the tiebreaker will be to use the bridge IDs and they will compare their bridge IDs and the one with the lowest bridge ID will take the designated port and as you can see our priority is 3768 or 8000 in hexadecimal and we can see switch 2 the MAC address is 2222 and switch 3 the MAC address is 3333 since the MAC address of switch 2 is lower than the MAC address of switch 3 then the switch 2 will take the designated port and switch 3 will be the blogging or alternate port okay let's label it on scenario 2 we can also see that the priority is 32768 or 8000 in hexadecimal and we can see that the root bridge has the mac address of ace and then switch 6 have b switch 7 has mac address of c's and switch 8 is this so by looking at our bridge id we can already tell that switch 5 is a root bridge 
and our root port will be on switch 6 and switch 7 will be the directly connected ports to root bridge okay let's label them and we already know that our root bridge will have uh, designated ports since switch 6 and switch 7 have lower bridge id than switch 8 then they will both assume the designated port okay let's label them now on switch 8 which port will be the designated port and which one will be the blocking or alternate port and to answer that we'll first start by the path cost and we can see from switch 8 to switch 6 is a cost of 4 and from switch 6 to our root bridge which is switch 5 it's another cost of 4 which makes it the cost of 8 for switch 8 to reach switch 5 using the link via switch 6 and if you go to the other link via switch 7 we can see from switch 8 to switch 7 is the cost of 4 and from switch 7 to switch 5 it's also the cost of 4 which also make it the cost of 8 so both paths have the cost of 8 meaning the tiebreaker will be the bridge id so we have to look at the bridge id of switch 6 and then we know the priority is 8000 in hexadecimal or 32768 in decimal and then we have the mac address of this and for switch 7 we have the mac address of C. so since well switch 6 mac address is lower than the mac address of switch 7 the link connected to switch 6 will assume the role of designated port and the link connected to switch 7 will assume the role of blocking port or alternate port Okay, let's label them. On our third scenario, we have two switches being switch 9 as the root bridge and switch 10. And as you can see, both our links are connected to the same switches, which means our bridge ID is the same. We all know we're going to start with the path cost and we can see our link have the cost of 4. So the path costs are the same for both links. So we have to rule that one out. And the second step is to use the bridge ID and we can see that the bridge ID for both links are the same so the third step to elect our root port is to choose the lower port so which lower port do we choose is it the local port or the transmitting or remote port so to answer that the lower port that we have to focus on is the transmitting or remote port in our case is the root bridge so since well we don't have identifiers for our link I'll take the left one as the lower port and the right one as the higher port. So meaning our left port will be uh, the root port and the right port will be the blocking port or alternate port. Remember that we have to have one designated port per segment or per link and our root bridge will assume the role of the designated ports. Okay, let's label our ports. Now that we are finished with our third scenario, let's go back to our second scenario so that we can correct our mistake. On our second scenario, switch 8 was supposed to elect the root port, not the designated port. Remember that we have one designated port per link or segment, and we have one root port per switch. And as we can see, already our switch 6 has already assumed the role of designated port. So we can have two designated port on a link. And if you go to switch 8, our switch 8 doesn't have a root port. So let's correct our mistake. Okay, let's label it root port. And now our scenario 2 is also correct. We can see that we have our root port and blocking port on switch 8. And then the segment between switch 6 and switch 8, we have designated port and root port. Last but not least, I would like us to learn the convergence of 802.1D meaning how long does it take an alternate or blocking port to take over when an active link is down we have four conversion states or mode that span in three follows they are blocking mode or state listening mode or state learning mode and forwarding and it takes about 50 seconds for 802.1d to converge i'll break it down or explain it for the learning purposes switches transmit bpd use every two seconds by default and if they don't receive BPD use, they'll wait around 20 seconds, which is equivalent of 10 BPD use sent or received before they move a blocking port to a listening port or listening interface. The listening state or mode is 15 seconds by default. 
determined by forward delay time. In this state or mode, the switch or interface can transmit and receive BPD use only. The next state or mode is learning, also determined by forward delay time. In this mode or state, the switch or interface will start learning MAC addresses on top of receiving and transmitting BPD use. And finally, after 50 seconds, we'll be in the last state, which is the forwarding mode or forwarding state. And there, the operational is per normal. We can send and receive normal data or frames. This brings us to the end of our lesson. Hope this lesson was informative and beneficial. And if you benefited from this lesson, please share it with someone who will also benefit from it. And please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can be notified whenever we drop another lesson. And also, don't be afraid to leave comment or criticism as they help us grow. Let me love and leave you. Have a blessed day. Enjoy your day.